Well, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us for our first virtual MLA Capstone Forum. Normally we have this wonderful opportunity to hear from some of our recent alumni uh, in May or June, uh, the year when many of these students graduate and they get a chance to tell you a little bit about their program of study, their concentration, their capstone, and then read to you and share with you some of their research and some of the um, things that they discovered and, and give you a chance to engage with some of the broad range of topics that people do in the Master of Liberal Arts. I'm Chris Pastor, I'm the director of the Master of Liberal Arts program. I'm joined by a colleague from LPS, Amy Mulhern, and we have four uh, speakers today, Amy Hellum, Nathaniel Borick, Brianna DuBose, and Dana Sanchour. They're all going to tell us a little bit about their capstones. Um, we'll go in alphabetical order. Uh, I'm your MC, uh, and it's always fun to have some of our really great students join us for this event, share some of the work that they've done. Um, it really exposes us and all the students and other folks who get a chance to listen to the breadth and the range of subjects that people can do in a liberal arts degree that they couldn't do in a lot of uh, much more narrow bandwidth cohort master's program. So it's a lot of fun for me because these are the students I enjoy advising because they're all challenging themselves in new ways, exploring new material. And then to finally see their capstones come together to see people graduate and move on and use a lot of the things that they did in their capstone and in their master of liberal arts degree um, in their professional life uh, is gratifying. Um, I'm sure it's really rewarding for the students, but it's also, I think, fun for other students and, and occasionally um, non-students, faculty, and others to come and hear about some of the great work that these uh, folks have done. Work my way through my different screens. And every time I switch screens, it's going to pause the share and then I'll have to start it up again. Um, sorry about that. Um, our first speaker is Nathaniel Boric. He's a 2020 graduate of the Master of Liberal Arts program whose coursework focused on urban studies, nonprofit strategy, and local public policy. Nathaniel works as an outreach and administrative associate with the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia's Community Development and Regional Outreach Department. A lifelong learner, since matriculating, Nathaniel uses most of his free time for piano lessons and learning new skateboard tricks. His capstone title is Community Wealth and Health, Redlining, Disinvestment, and Trauma in Neighborhoods. His readers were Teresa Gillen and Nancy Watterson. Nathaniel, take it away. Thanks so much, Chris. And thanks to everybody for being here. Uh, as Chris said, my name is Nathaniel Bork. I'm here to talk a little bit about my Master's of Liberal Arts experience, as well as my capstone project, uh, Community Wealth and Health, Redlining, Disinvestment, and Trauma in Neighborhoods. Next slide, please. The Master's of, of Liberal Arts program was really attractive to me for its inter interdisciplinary and, and uh, kind of, uh, not unstructured, but it's kind of loosely structured nature. Uh, as a full-time employee, it was really important to me to find a program that was flexible about my work hours. It was also really important for me to find a program that allowed me to take a, a kind of smattering of, of courses. I have a background in economics and philosophy. I also have an associate's degree in photography. So uh, I'm a little bit uh, all over the place in terms of my interests. And so I really uh, gravitate towards those kinds of interdisciplinary programs. So the MLA program was uh, kind of perfect for me. Uh, I've highlighted just a few of the course titles uh, that stand out for me from uh, my, my coursework. Uh, I did a cross-listed course that was a history and also urban studies course uh, called Perspectives on Urban Poverty uh, that really took a deep dive into kind of what was the social science of the day throughout the 20th century around urban poverty, uh, what were the different narratives that were offered as an explanation for the, the persistence of poverty and the best kinds of programs for addressing those things. I also took a, a, a nonprofit management course called uh, Neighborhood Displacement and Community Power uh, that was really uh, kind of how-to for community organizing that had really great case studies and examples of previous community organizing uh, campaigns and, uh, and groups. Uh, and then uh, Philanthropy in the City was also cross-listed. That's an urban studies program urban studies uh, course, but uh, it's also within the nonprofit management uh, master's program at SP2. Uh, it's really an interesting interdisciplinary program. It's co-taught uh, co by a professor who has experience in the philanthropic world in 
you know, taking on donations from family foundations and things like that and going through the grant making process. Uh, and then uh, the other professor has a, a background in seeking donations and trying to get those grants. So it's uh, kind of two sides of the same coin. And then finally, uh, community and economic economic development law and policy was really just all about what are the laws that guide community and economic development practice. So it's a, a really interesting program. And again, kind of from the law school to SP2, to the urban studies program, uh, to things cross-listed with uh, uh, you know, the history department and elsewhere. It's a, uh, were it not for the Master of Liberal Arts program, I wouldn't have been able to take such an interesting cross-section of uh, courses that helps to lead to and inform my capstone, which I'll talk more about on the next few slides. So uh, my, my broad interest in community and economic development is really kind of things at the cutting edge. You know, well, what are we doing in terms of kind of paired services? Uh, you know, community development is traditionally focused on uh, developing housing, developing neighborhoods. Uh, so physical infrastructure, but of course, uh, community services with, that are associated within infrastructure are also really important to consider. Uh, but you know, one of the a, a driving factor, uh, as we all know, uh, in in 2020, there's a lot, a lot in the news about kind of segregation and continued uh, you know, uh, disparities, inequities in race relations within the country, uh, and so. One thing that uh, a lot of people may have heard about recently uh, is this uh, issue of redlining and disinvestment. Redlining is uh, a, it, it was a practice that happened in the early 20th century. Uh, certain federal agencies and banks uh, denied access to credit to whole neighborhoods. They would draw a, a red line around a neighborhood on a map uh, and would take deposits from those neighborhoods but would not make loans business loans or, or housing loans to folks living in those neighborhoods. And of course, over time, that has the impact of kind of denying wealth to those communities, pulling wealth out of those communities, extracting wealth, and also reducing the quality of housing in the neighborhood more broadly. Uh, you know, importantly, some background, there is a, a, just a whole uh, plethora of medical studies over the past 15, 20 years, which have, had, which have found that housing and neighborhoods are a social determinant of health. That means that what neighborhood you live in really impacts your health outcomes and other social determinants can really affect your health outcomes. But importantly for my, for my focus here, housing and neighborhoods are one of them. Uh, and then a definition of trauma. Uh, trauma results from an event, series of events uh, or circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening life -threatening, and that has effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. So my argument within my capstone is really that redlining can be a kind of trauma. You know, being denied access to credit, being denied access to wealth building opportunities is kind of by definition life-threatening. It is something that threatens the well-being of your neighborhood in kind of mental, physical, social, and emotional terms. Uh, and on the next slide, we'll get some interesting visual representations of this. Uh, so this is a, a map showing uh, the city of Philadelphia, and it shows where uh, those red-lined communities were. You can see that uh, the, the red portions of this uh, map here uh, were those that were deemed uh, you know, unsuitable to, to lend to. And you can see that that overlaps not perfectly, but, but largely with a lot of homicides in the year 2019. Uh, and on the next slide, there's a, a similar map. This map comes from uh, the city comptroller, Rebecca Reinhardt. Uh, she found that uh, a whole wealth of data sets uh, on kind of well-being, things like poverty, access to healthcare, uh, exp you know, ex exposure and experiences of physical violence or, or crime, these things also overlap and correlate with communities that have experienced redlining. You can see that those same neighborhoods that were redlined are disproportionately likely to also have higher levels of disadvantage on other social metrics. So on the next slide, uh, you know, the case that I really try to make is that 
when you think about trauma, people tend to focus on individuals, but this happens for communities as well. This happened, you know, redlining is an inherently communal thing. It happens to an entire neighborhood, not just this individual person within a neighborhood. So here, you know, uh, this is a, an image pulled from uh, Google Street View in uh, the Philadelphia neighborhood, Northern Liberties, uh, the corner of Gerard Avenue and Germantown Avenue. In the late 20th century, this neighborhood was predominantly Hispanic and Latin, right? And you can see that represented in this mural. And on the next slide, 10 years later in 2019, there is uh, this commercial and and, ha and residential development that has covered up that mural. And so the point that I'm trying to make more broadly is that development can lead to kind of communal erasure in terms of you know, things like murals, things like community gardens, the way that people kind of conceive of their block or their neighborhood can dr be dramatically changed by the way that development plays out. And this can be experienced in ways that are perceived as threatening by the community themselves. Uh, and next slide. The flip side of all that is that certain, you know, th these same spaces can be, can be spaces for healing. They can be spaces for creating a greater sense of, of community, for fostering those kind of deep community roots. roots. This is a mural uh, that is in the West Powelton neighborhood of Philadelphia. It's a, a mural uh, as a tribute to a neighborhood called the Black Bottom uh, that was, uh, you know, near to the University City area, and and you know, as folks from that neighborhood re recall, you know, displaced by the expansion of University City over the past several decades. And the mural says, "Gone but not forgotten," and lists, you know, a. a a bunch of folks who are from the community who fought in different wars and has just some thoughts and prayers written up on the wall about kind of what the community meant to those folks and what it still means to the people who still live in the neighborhood today. So again, communities, you know, it, it's really important. Communities and development interact in complicated ways and it's really important to recognize that these kinds of symbols can be powerful uh, if they are kind of paved over, but they can also be powerful if they're funded and if they are given, you know, uh, if people are given resources to make these things uh, last in perpetuity or sustainable or make new projects around things like green spaces, civic art centers, and the like. Uh, and next slide. You know, there are uh, a number of models kind of showing what it means to be a, to do trauma informed services and uh, you know none of them have been have been applied particularly in response to redlining but i'm trying to make the case here that uh, there's a need for more data to show to the, the degree to which those services are effective and how they might be combined with or coordinated alongside uh, community development services, services, affordable housing and the like. And you know, this is not new. Nonprofit organizations, charitable organizations, and even just you know, your neighbors who help one another have been pairing community services uh, for you know, the, since the dawn of time probably. But uh, you know, we do well to remember that. People often don't have, people who need these kind of resources, people, people who need this kind of help, uh, you know, often don't have a whole lot of extra capacity to go out of their way to access different resources. So if we can make resource hubs or again, civic centers, things along those lines where folks can get connected to a broad suite of resources that kind of recognizes the deep and complicated history of their community or their neighborhood or their family, right? Those are the kinds of things that can help to make communities whole again and can help people to get a leg up on the, on the uh, economic and social ladder. I think that is the uh, remainder of my slides. Yes. Great. Thanks, Chris. Oh, well, thanks, Nathaniel. Um, does anybody have any questions you want to ask Nathaniel that he could answer about uh, what he's been doing? I, I thought that was amazing. I, I thought that was amazing, Nathaniel. Really, it was kudos. Um, I'm interested in so many of the same 
topics. I'm wondering, well, I'll email you, but um, two resources that I think you'd enjoy if, you have, if you're not already familiar with them. One, um, a book that talks about redlining called The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's, it's a good one. Um, and also there's a, a professor out of Harvard, like pub, School of Public Health, who does a discriminate, who created a discrimination scale. And he has a fantastic TED video called How Racism Makes Us Sick, which is a lot of, covers a lot of what you talked about. And then the last thing is um, at University of Pennsylvania, a, uh, there's a course, it's like a little, it's a short course, like a two week course or something, I think, by Riza Lavizo Mori called From Health Disparities to Health Equity. And she looks at Philadelphia neighborhoods in that course as well. So super interesting. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, we're lucky. There are some really interesting programs right in this area. Um, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia is really well known for being a leader in kind of, uh, they, they have programs where they help to fund affordable housing uh, rehabilitation and things like that. And it, a lot of it has, is centered around, in particular, asthma and, and the role that old housing and kind of lower quality housing and in particular lead walls that have lead paint on them mm -hmm. and the expense of that remedi remediation. Uh, but it's amazing that a hospital can realize that it's cheaper for them to get lead remediated in the neighborhood around them than it is to just keep serving the same children and families kind of year after year coming back with the same asthmatic symptoms, et cetera. It's, uh, it's uh, incredibly complicated. And thank you for shouting out those resources. Uh, um, Rothstein's book is cited in, in, my, in my work cited, but it's all I will look into the other two. Yeah. It's also interesting, I think this is a, a great topic with the idea that in many cities that had fallen on hard times with er, white flight um, and then urban renewal was you know, an effort to combat that, but oftentimes with wholesale neighborhood displacement and, and effectively community destruction. So Superblock of Penn was an urban renewal project um, to build the high rises on Penn's campus across 38th Street, across the bridge that was built. And that was an entire neighborhood that was just asked to, to move effectively. And there's this unfortunate since, you know, even in the present day, a general assumption that all development is good development because everything's better than a vacant lot. But the question is oftentimes what's around the vacant lots and what are those lots being used for, as you said, whether they're dignifying the, the residents of the community with murals and imagery or something's being used as a um, as a community garden, um, the owner of that property often nine times out of 10 is an absentee landlord who's waiting for the rising tide of property values to make development uh, much more profitable. And cities, communities, institutions, especially large ones at Penn, have been really bad at being partners with the residents of the community. They've been much better at being partners with developers because developers will come in and offer to open and close streets, change rights of way, change traffic patterns, add new lights, add new resources that the institutions in the city want, not things that the current residents actually really need from them. And also those residents have been denied a variety of things they've needed for the last 30 or 40 years. So whether we call it gentrification or development, in many cases, it's, it's maybe not always intentional or mindful, but in many cases, as you said, this is where I think your, your understanding of this as community trauma um, is, is important. It's something that is effectively ignoring other, a, a range of the um, stakeholders' needs. And one of the reasons may very well be that a lot of the folks that are either renters um, or you know, maybe renters through Section 8 even, more so with absentee landlords and things, they're not really seen as stakeholders. They're seen as almost as transient as opposed to residents, community members. So it may very well be that there's, that there's a lot of issues that we need to um, re-address on our own terms about what makes someone a, you know, a resident, what makes someone a person who has ownership and, and a stake in that community. We usually think you have to own the property to have a stake. Otherwise, you could be anywhere. And, that, and I think that's a, a major societal failing and institutional failing that we, we um, you know, perpetuate this problem. Yeah, I was really excited to find some, uh, some models, uh, the Urban Institute in DC uh, and, and some uh, 
affordable housing uh, and community development groups in the San Francisco area uh, have done what they call kind of trauma-informed housing development or housing services that I cite in my capstone that are, you know, Chris, to your point, they're the whole, you know, because tr trauma is often a, a, an experience that removes control, right? It, if, if you feel threatened, it's often because you are, lack control in a situation where, where your well-being is or you perceive it to be threatened. And so uh, trauma-informed services often have at their root this idea of giving people who have experienced that kind of trauma control back over like the kinds of policies that, that, that dictate, right. you know, like the degree to which they can be late on rent or, or how to make back payments or even just informing things like, are we going to change the direction of this street or put up a stop sign or a street light or, you know, do we get funding for this park or for that civic center? And so you know, they, there are these interesting models that I cite in my capstone where it's all centered around you know, engaging with existing residents and giving them decision-making power and engaging them in a way that is accessible for them, right? Like having meetings during the day and also at night, having meetings that have childcare at them, having meetings that have snacks and meals at them, right? right. Paying, like the same way that you might pay a consultant to inform your strategy or your project, right? Paying residents for their time when they are volunteering for you to, to get the word out about the new policy or the new community forum next week. It, it's a, there's some really interesting models out there about kind of how to embrace the, those best practices. Yeah, and then if that's combined with elected officials and other policymakers in administrations, whether we're talking governmental institutional, um, recognizing that it's also important to not just invite comment and input from these individuals, you know, and find ways to foster their engagement, but also to, you know, actually give them an equal amount of leverage, you know, in the ultimate decision making process. Because a lot of times, I think it gets papered over pretty quickly as, um, and then it moves quickly onto a review board, um, and then the quick decision is, oh, you don't have standing in this because you're just a tenant, right? You don't own the property. And so we, we see a lot of well-intentioned things, I think oftentimes go by the wayside, but, but at a practice level. But really fast, awesome, really, really neat, great work. Um, and I think the folks you're reading, but also the work you're doing, and then what you're doing is taking it back into the workplace as a community outreach um, officer effectively. This is the kind of stuff that can really make us make a city that we're try that's trying to be better, you know, not just look better and have fewer vacant lots, but to be a place that's a, a better home for the folks that have been here all along. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Chris. Um, our next presenter is Brianna DuBose, who also graduated in 2020 from the MLA program. Her concentration was in organizational behavior. Within Brianna's research, she looked at the intersection of diversity and inclusion, sports organizations, and leadership. While at Penn, Brianna advised undergraduate students as a graduate associate and design programs at the Graduate Center as a fellow. Currently, Brianna started her own e-commerce brand called Black and Ballin' to support Black athletes in their transitions to work post-graduation, and she's applying to jobs and PhD programs in her field. Feel free to connect with her on LinkedIn. Her capstone to topic was After the Ball Goes Flat, an exploratory study on Black female former athletes and their transitions from college sports to professional careers. Her readers were Dr. Kim Torres and Dr. Karen Weaver. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Well, first, uh, thank you for inviting me to speak tonight. I'm really excited. Anything pen related, um, you know, it's awesome right now because, like I was saying earlier, I'm in I'm in Maryland, so it's a little different, like not being on campus and engaging with all of uh, the great faculty and friends and colleagues and all that good stuff. But to my presentation, all right, let's go. First slide. Um, so first, what I want to emphasize is that with this MLA program, I was very intentional on making sure that. I was getting the best out of my graduate school experience. I mean, I felt that in undergrad, it was really kind of 
dead set on a certain amount of classes you have to take in a certain discipline. Um, it wasn't really intersectional. And I knew that with my graduate study, I wanted to do more. So within the MLA program, I took a diverse set of classes in higher ed, organizational dynamics, Africana studies, liberal arts, and behavioral and decision sciences. And my concentration was overall organizational behavior. And I basically took uh, from each of those classes and molded it into my own research. The primary focus of my classroom instruction, like I just said, was um, to apply this information to sports organizations in particular. I don't know if you got the gist, but I'm a former athlete. Um, I played division one basketball and I really was interested specifically to challenge the organizational structure of college athletic programs. Because at the basic level, um, of sports, right? It's still an organization. And so with how things were kind of going and shaping and molding within the college athletic space, I wanted to kind of reframe and look at these issues from a different lens. Next slide, please. So my research, like Chris said earlier, was entitled After the Ball Goes Flat. And a lot of people are like, some people get it right away and other people are kind of like, huh, what do you mean by that, Brianna? So after the ball goes flat is something that I heard in high school. Uh, ironically, my coach would always say that in practice. And was like, one day the ball's going to go flat, Brianna. One day it's going to happen. And I was like, what do you mean by that? He's like, you know, one day your career will be over. Um, and so it's a really great figure of speech to kind of just put everything into perspective of what athletes go through because essentially 99% of student athletes do not go on to play sports professionally. And so you're wondering how are resources kind of being distributed within their athletics department to ensure they thrive after sports and beyond the game. And it's a major issue that I see and that I'll kind of get into with, with what I discussed in my research but one of the biggest things is that you're spending so much time with your sport, right? And obviously with your academic side, because you want to be eligible to play your sport. But then where does that leave for career readiness resources, for, um, you know, culturally uh, sensitive resources, and obviously acknowledging all the intersections that uh, college athletes bring to the table. And so I saw that this was a really unique working population. I put air quotes around working because technically college athletes are not uh, employees of the university, but they help to generate billions and billions of dollars for their university, for the NCAA as a collective. Um, and it's really, uh, it's practically unregulated this, is, this population is very vulnerable. And obviously the, the age range is the emerging adulthood uh, kind of space. And so it's this very transformative time period of your life. It's a very impressionable one. And so I found that it was like the perfect storm for organizational diagnosis. And so, like I said before, I really wanted to address the intersections of sports, of blackness, of womanhood, and being a double minority. What I was finding was that essentially there weren't a large number of um, researchers and articles and things like that, specifically on the black female athlete experience. And then there were even fewer articles on athlete transitions in general, let alone uh, within the black athlete space and understanding uh, the cultural uh, background and the socioeconomic uh, factors that go into the makeup of Black athletes and, and the demands and so on and so forth. Um, but basically, uh, at, the, at the crux of this, I wanted to assess resources that were missing in the Black female athlete experience to ensure that they can thrive post-graduation and that they feel good with their, not only their experience in college, but where they're headed. Um, next slide, please. So this is gonna be a lot of research jargon. I took it from my abstract, but um, within my study, the purpose was to examine the in-college and post-college experiences of black female former athletes 
this was a qualitative study. I, over a three month period, I interviewed 10 division one black female former athletes, six revenue and four non-revenue generating uh, athletes, basically within the, the college athletic space. If you're a revenue generating, excuse me, if you're a revenue generating athlete, you're either playing football, men's basketball and women's basketball. So I got to interview six revenue generating and four non-revenue generating athletes who graduated between the years of 2014 to 2019. And like I said, for over a three month time period, interviews were roughly 45 minutes to an hour and a half. And I really wanted to make sure that I had a range when it came to this population um, and demographic because I wanted to make sure that my results were kind of you know, if they were going to be consistent, they were going to be consistent. If they were going to be all over the place, they were going to be all over the place. But I didn't want the age to really kind of dictate the experience because within the NCAA, rules change literally yearly. So I wanted to see if this phenomenon that I was bringing up and obviously these issues that I wanted to research were consistent over this time period. Um, And obviously it's pretty relative. It's not even that long ago, but so much changes every year within this space. So the major findings amongst respondents included adjusting to college athletics and academic rigor, athletics time commitment, more career readiness resources needed in transitioning to the workforce, and of course the significance of race in their professional lives. And so Conclusively, athletic departments really are significantly lacking in preparing Black female athletes for their next phase of life and being conscious of the limitations presented due to a lack of social capital upon university entry. I say that because this obviously was a very consistent finding amongst all 10 of my respondents from schools all over the country, uh, Division I universities, and colleges and I wanted to see how from an organizational perspective how I could equate this to work for example like just or regular work right and I found that basically you know it all comes to investing in your employees right you know I'm going to keep air quoting around student athletes because they're technically not employees but in the context of organizational theory right the organization that's really invested in their employees and the work they do and is very people focused usually has a better financial return um, better attitudes towards work more motivation so on and so forth and essentially this is all uh, predicated upon the uh, investment that the employer is putting into the people that are actually doing the work right that are actually uh, doing these services or programming these devices or whatever it may be and within the college athletic space because uh, this space is not necessarily regulated um, a lot of this kind of goes under um, it just kind of goes unnoticed right so there's so many issues that kind of come about and then you leave out after four to five years and you know nothing's changed organizationally or structurally and college athletes are very dissatisfied with their experiences because they look up and say wow i just spent you know four to five years playing this sport and investing so much in this institution but what am i getting back from this experience and so um i definitely recommend that college athletic programs kind of put more into their athletes. And obviously this issue is pretty big. It's, you know, heading to different courts and it's going state by state and athletes are trying to get, or college athletes, excuse me, are trying to get paid uh, for their, um, you know, for their play. It's literally pay for play. But the biggest thing is just making sure that they're being properly set up to thrive after graduation, after giving so much um, for their sport. Next slide, please. I think this is the last one. Try to, you know, be concise with with Chris's guidelines. So post-graduation, like I said, or like Chris said earlier in my introduction, I was inspired to start an empowerment brand for Black athletes. And basically what I do is I take stuff from my research, my, my published research, and I put it in digestible content online. And so, you know, as a, I kind of reframed it as if I was 17 or 18 years old in that like college 
athlete range, how would I have wanted to see this really pertinent information be presented to me so that I'm informed and can make, you know, better informed decisions for myself and demand that uh, these resources are given to me in my own experience. Um, so I've really just, I design digestible content for aimed at, uh, you know, that age range of emerging adulthood uh, student athletes. And um, like I said earlier, the MLA program has inspired me to consciously think outside the box and always be at the intersection. I think so many things in the world are just, you know, they go hand in hand with one another and you really can't just do one thing without thinking about the other. And so I really have an emphasis on my life of just always kind of being at the intersection and really thinking outside the box to make sure that I'm getting the most out of whatever I'm doing. This is why I'm so big on holistic uh, development and understanding organizational structure and all these good things. And I want to continue this research at the doctoral level, um, basically expanding into larger scale research to assess potential holistic business solutions for transitioning minority athletes. Um, for those of you who aren't in the space, this is actually something that is uh, getting bigger, more uh, companies and consulting firms are starting to focus on athlete transitions. And, you know, basically they're getting bought out to see like which services are needed at a higher scale, at a higher rate. And so I want to kind of see how this carries over into research and what the actual needs are um, with a larger sample size, a larger and more diverse sample size. Um, and of course, I'm, a, I'm applying for jobs right now, post-graduation, and I'd love to work in higher ed or the sports organizational space. So that is me, and I think that is it. So thank you. Thank you again. This is great. Uh, thanks, Brianna. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question. So um, again, sorry. So do you, how do you feel about college athletes being compensated for play in college and would that really make any difference in helping them after graduation? The, the issue <laughs> is that college, colleges and universities are making so much money off of them. It's, it's really like disgusting. It's like you're making hundreds of millions of dollars um, and the college athlete doesn't see any of that. So when we talk about um, just getting that next leg up, when we talk about equity and all these great things, um, within the revenue generating uh, sports space for college athletes, it's predominantly black. And so when we talk about equity and making sure that you have uh, social capital and can kind of talk about generational wealth, like paying college athletes will be a huge, huge, huge upside to um you know just their overall well-being do i think that it should be kind of regulated at least in the beginning because i mean if i was 17 and someone just handed me like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, like here this is for you like for the season i you know obviously might kind of you know blow it i'm not gonna lie <laughs> so obviously kind of getting that financial help and making sure um that college athletes understand where this money is coming from, how they can use it, how they can save it, and obviously turn it into uh, something that they can be successful with later on. I do think it will help. That's a long, a long version, but I do think it would help significantly. Yeah, and I guess one thing that it may force into play is an acknowledgement that this is, as you said, a largely unregulated area in a lot of ways where the NCAA self polices what institutions, organizations, sports teams, coaches, and players do and one of the number one things that they don't worry the most about is making sure that students have their eyes open for what the academic opportunities are that the university system is built for mm -hmm. and how college sports works around that and then it's as opposed to with it right so the in an ideal world the athletes would be getting an advantage um, in terms of a, a well-supported education that would set them up for the rest of their life when they're they're game, they're 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 no longer playing their their the game right, mm -hmm. but unfortunately I think that even especially in the revenue generating sports that mm -hmm. is far and away the least important part of the sport to the university is making sure those folks can make a living after they are finished playing, 
And right. in the players' minds, they, they're the ones where they could pursue a professional career, even if it's in like a second level league in Romania, right, mm -hmm. for money. So they're less worried about their education. And I, so that unregulate, that lack of regulation oftentimes is exploitative, I think, mm -hmm. because it's playing on people's expectation sets, not really being oriented around what's the number one potential beneficial takeaway if you cannot play the sport professionally. Right. And so I think that's where, I, you know, things that you might learn from studying non-revenue generating sports, kids who came to college and were recruited or kids who were actually came, walked onto a sport after they were not recruited, did the sport help them with discipline and with success? Could we translate those good outcomes into the world of the revenue generating sports? Mm -hmm. And I think forcing these legal decisions on paying players and acknowledging their value to the university might be a step towards literally, quite frankly, corralling academic directors and sports, um, the, 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 the you know, athletics departments in universities into towing the line more rigorously mm -hmm. about the uh, academic mission is paramount. Everything else is secondary. You know, when you, we lose that when we see football coaches getting $7 million a year and right. every year when they give that guy an extension, they pull five faculty lines because we can't afford it. You know, right. so suddenly they don't replace five faculty members who retire. So That's I think that what you're doing in looking at the student side of things um, in terms of on an outcome-based set thing that then looks at what kind of resources they, they're not delivered. These are the kind of things that really, you know, could force universities to sort of step up and pay attention. You know, it's really fascinating. Absolutely, absolutely. I think, well, the last thing I'll kind of say is that it's, it really is more significant than people think. Like, you know, in a lot of states, um, especially that don't have like, you know, large scale sports, usually universities are the main employers of that state. And, yeah. you know, the University of Alabama's of the world, right? If they didn't play college football, that would be a major blow to the institution because they're bringing in so much revenue, right? They're bringing in students that want to go to the University of Alabama. They're bringing in revenue for, uh, for research and grants and, and, you know, hiring new uh, faculty and so many different things that kind of go hand in hand with this. And because the NCAA is a membership organization, they kind of have one foot in and one foot out in terms of decision making. It's really sad. People think it's all on the NCAA and it's really not. It's really a, a point of these individual schools to set the tone. And it really just kind of falls back on the shoulders of these 17 and 22 year olds playing mm -hmm. a game. Um, and then at the end of the day, kind of being clustered into a major, like, you know, that they might not even want to do, but they can kind of push them along and make sure they're eligible so they can be able to play. But then you graduate and you're like, what is, why did I just graduate with a general studies degree? Or why did I just graduate, you know, in sociology and I wanted to do biology, right? right. Um, because they needed you eligible and then you graduate, and you don't know what to do. So it's really interesting structurally. And um, this pandemic has kind of, you know, reared its ugly head in a number of ways, especially in the college athletic space. So I'm kind of excited actually to kind of see where it goes and how change will be implemented so that this whole system doesn't crumble. <laughs> yeah, really fascinating. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other questions? Thanks, Brianna. Absolutely. Um, our next speaker is Amy Black Hellum. She's a health communication scholar and president of Hellum Consulting, medical research, writing, and marketing firm she founded following a 12 year tenure as editor in chief at WebMD, formerly Jobs in Medical Information. Amy earned a BA at Marywood University, an MLA at the uh, at University of Pennsylvania and a graduate certificate in healthcare innovation at the University of Pennsylvania and Perlman School of Medicine. She's published more than 200 articles and scientific papers. While completing her PhD in health and strategic communication, Amy remains actively engaged in the healthcare industry, designing programs that promote advances in medical research, education, and healthcare delivery. Her clients include several leading pharmaceutical and medical device corporations, as well as publishing houses, medical centers, and physician groups. Her capstone title is Pursuing Value in Standards of Care, an examination of how medical guidelines are developed, formalized, communicated, and adopted in the United States. And our readers were Guy David and Joshua Duniaf. Okay. Let me start the share.
Thanks, Amy. Thank you so much. So um, thanks for the introduction. Tonight, um, I want to talk to you about an issue that's become really near and dear to me, namely standard of care. But before I get into that, I want to share a little bit about my own journey um, and how this program fit into it in a really remarkably untraditional way. So uh, we can switch to the next slide, which we're going to be on for like half of my presentation. <laughs> So, like everyone, uh, in high school, well, my journey began in high school, where I was an exceedingly uninvolved student, but that all changed after I graduated, by the grace of God. Um, I attended Marywood University, at the time it was called Marywood College, and that academic experience changed me for the better. Um, I was a great student. I studied abroad. I took 21 credits a semester with a heavy course load, even in the summer. And I graduated magna cum laude in fewer than three years. So I'd like to say that I was able to do this because I'm smart, but that's not really the case. Um, in fact, it had more to do with the fact that I had to pay my way through school and I couldn't wait to graduate and start earning money. So in any case, I moved to Scrant from Scranton, Pennsylvania to Philadelphia at the tail end of my last semester as an undergraduate. And I was fortunate to get a really exciting job that I was grossly unqualified for, working for a group of Temple University professors who established a nonprofit organization that essentially overhauled the way substance abusing nonviolent offenders are treated or penalized in court and prison systems in Philadelphia. So it was really interesting work and it was honorable work, but it barely paid the bills and it definitely didn't align with my personal life goals, which included studying English literature and someday teaching at the university level. So in an effort to keep my eyes focused on my longer term goals, I enrolled in the MLA program at Penn. And for a year, I got to do it all. I even spent a summer with other Penn students who are now lifelong friends studying Shakespeare at Oxford University. So, wow, to be young again, seems like a lifetime ago. Uh, my bubble kind of burst my second year in the program when circumstances put me out of commission for the better part of a year. So I had to start being an adult and making choices in the interest of you know, kind of financial preservation. So I left the nonprofit and I took a higher paying job at a medical publishing company. And at that time, I also made the heartbreaking decision to leave Penn. On a happier note, I was promoted twice in two years and was soon scooped up by another company that's now owned by WebMD. So I worked for the second company for 12 years and became editor in chief of several of their journals. These were all peer to peer physician journals. My division did a lot of custom publishing as well, strategy and marketing for large pharmaceutical and device manufacturers. So I, I met a lot of people during that time who helped me build the business that I, that I have now. But also during my years in publishing, I had three children and having three children makes it pretty difficult to jet set around for work much less consider the extravagance of returning to school. So I soldiered on, juggling way too many balls all at once until one day it just felt like it was too much. So, you know, they say you can have it all, but they neglect to mention that doing it all can really kind of suck. Um, lucky for me, fate smiled on me and my family when my husband was relocated to California for work. So we decided to move to a small kind of bedroom community that had really low taxes and affordable housing so that I could get my life back together and focus on my kids for a while. Uh, I won't lie, it was truly sublime, um, not working for a little while, but it didn't last. Um, all the connections that I made when I was working started calling me and asking me to consult. So seemingly overnight I had really what seemed like a perfect situation where I was home with my kids and I was researching and writing again instead of just kind of managing people and flying on airplanes. So over the years, I kind of 
got into a groove and established a healthy base of clients and started to feel a lot more secure. I was secure, but I definitely did not feel complete because I still wasn't pursuing my dreams. You know, I developed a lot of new passions and I learned a bunch of skills that had never really crossed my mind before, but I kind of felt like I let myself down. Um, so I called, so I called Dr. Pastore and I asked him what I had to do to re-enter the MLA program. And they say we're our own worst critics. Um, and I think that's true because Penn really welcomed me back with open arms and it changed my life. Um, obviously I wouldn't be here tonight if that weren't the case. So I only had two classes and a capstone left. And like I said, in the 20 plus years that had elapsed, my interests really changed quite a bit, but I still really wanted to teach. More importantly, I knew that I was, I knew what I was good at and I was able to apply that self-awareness when I was choosing my courses and developing my final project. One of the greatest benefits I would say of studying at the University of Pennsylvania is the multidisciplinary environment. I mean, there, there's an expert here in just about anything that might interest you. And I mean, really my advice to anybody who's coming into this program is that you shouldn't be afraid to take full advantage of that because I, I definitely didn't. So given the fact that I spent the last couple of decades working in medicine, it was really important to me that whatever classes I took here at Penn and whatever research I pursued for my capstone, I needed to make sure that it had practical application to where my life is realistically headed right now. And realistically, if I'm being honest with myself, I try to figure out who am I, what am I, what is it that I really do? Um, I'm a communication scientist, that's what I do. That's the one thing that all of my studies and all of that experience up until that point had in common. But at the same time, my bread and butter is in healthcare. Well, lucky me, guess what? It turns out there's actually such a thing as a health communication scientist. And I decided that that's what I was going to become. So my last two classes, it, I took my last two classes toward my MLA in the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy at the School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. And I studied some really cool stuff, um, health economics, behavioral economics, health law, um, healthcare leadership, disparities in healthcare, research ethics. Um, and as, as Chris mentioned, uh, Dr. David offered to be my capstone advisor, which was so amazing. And my second reader is actually a really world-renowned um, a world-renowned researcher in one of the most prevalent vision-threatening diseases in the world. Specifically, he studies age-related macular degeneration, which ironically is also what I had been studying in my business life outside of school. So it was really an, a great intersection. And uh, the way that the two intersected was one of my, one of my like, biggest clients at work developed this technology that helps detect age-related macular degeneration before you can see it, before it's clinically evident. So this makes it possible for patients and doctors to you know, take steps to avoid preventable blindness. So the scientist who developed this technology, super smart guy, he hired me, um, an English major, to, <laughs> get this, uh, change the standard of care, which I thought that sounded hysterical, um, asking again, an English major to help change the standard of care for a disease that affects millions of people in this country. But as crazy as it sounded, I thought it sounded kind of fun as well. So um, we can finally go to the next slide. So to be clear, I have not actually changed the standard of care in ophthalmology yet, but I did manage to elucidate what standard of care really means. And what I found is that it's not what we think it is. It's not even what physicians think it is. And more crazy still, if you ask a physician what the standard of care is <clears throat> in his or her specialty, you're not going to get a very clear answer. 
In fact, you'll probably get a lot of contradictory answers. So that's what I studied for my capstone project. And can switch the next slide, please. So I found this whole experience so compelling that I decided to stay on at Penn for an extra semester after completing my MLA to also obtain a graduate certificate in health in healthcare innovation from the School of Medicine. And during that same time, I also applied and was accepted into Chapman University's health communication PhD program, which began this fall. So in this new program, I'm continuing this same research that I started here at Penn. And in the last like minute or two that I have left, I will kind of introduce you to some of that research. If you can switch to the next slide. So long story short, as the father of evidence-based medicine, David Sackett once said to a group of medical residents, quote, half of what you'll learn in medical school will be shown to be either dead wrong or out of date within five years of your, of your graduation. The trouble is that nobody can tell you which half. This really sums up the challenge that healthcare providers face when they're making medical decisions on the basis of standards of care as they understand them. <clears throat> so if you can switch to the next slide, please. So you might ask, well, what is standard of care? And the answer is, well, that depends. When you hear that something is the new standard of care, you probably assume it's better. In fact, you probably think it's like really great, but here's the thing. In fact, this is the one thing I can tell you with absolute certainty about standard of care. If you're really sick, like really, really sick, the last thing you want is to be treated by a physician who follows standard of care to the letter. And here's why. Standard of care may have really awesome connotations, but in fact, legally speaking, it's not the best professional standard. It's not even average. Standard of care as determined in a court of law is a demonstration of minimal competence. Now, it didn't always used to be that way, but that is how the law evolved and that's how it is today. At the same time, however, medicine is sharing a lexicon with the courts that clearly does not align. And this sort of ill-defined, this like ill-defined nomenclature has resulted in basically a nation full of patients, doctors, and marketers kind of running around bragging about what's possibly a, a really inferior product or procedure. And more confusing still, as my research revealed, the medical literature itself is usually the platform for this whole discussion and debate. So they kind of perpetuate the confusion, if you will. So if you can switch to the last slide, please. Great. So what are the consequences of this? Well, from a marketing perspective, which is kind of what I used to do, sort of a dream come true because after all, you can promise that your product is the standard of care and the whole world will think that that's just fantastic. When in reality, you're, if you're really called to the carpet, you're not making outlandish illegal claims. So, in closing, the term standard of care means different things to different people. And furthermore, it's also changed very significantly over time, leading to a lot of confusion and occasionally to you know, some exploitation if it implies an unwarranted authenticity. Importantly though, if you take one thing away from this, I would hope that it's this, that standard of care really must be distinguished from quality of care because the two things are most definitely not synonymous. Um, in short, the purpose of standard setting really ought to be quality, but historically it's kind of lowered the bar, possibly stifling healthcare innovation. Yet, Despite these challenges, physicians, researchers, and industry, they do miraculously continue to affect change for the better, especially here at Penn, as I have learned. And um, 
That's kind of why I'm so proud to have graduated from this really awesome, all-inclusive, marvelous program. So thank you. Thanks, Amy. Anybody have any questions for Amy? It's kind of fascinating. Uh, th these things kind of are intersecting a little bit in the sense that a lot of times the consumer, let's just say, or a resident, or uh, you know, a participant in an activity doesn't actually always have all the information they need to function uh, in a sort of equal partner in their own life. Um, yeah. Whether we're talking about a resident in a neighborhood, a, a ball player, or a student, or a patient, or a doctor. Um, and generally our assumption is that institutions and government should step in and actually be our voice advocate for us and that the law might actually make sure that, that that advocacy is going to be handled with some discretion and with some fairness in terms of distribution of assets and resources and improved outcomes. But concepts like the idea that the standard of care, and, and you hear it because we're all sort of forced to kind of be our own healthcare advocates, even if we have health insurance through our employer, because without national health care, we have to sort through our own paperwork and figure out what doctors are best, who's in network, whether what they're doing and what they're charging us first on copay and coinsurance is, is good value for our money in terms of health outcomes. And so if you then think of standard of care, and, and especially those of us who are in a graduate program or work in institutions like Penn who are fairly well educated, our general assumption would be, well, if they're operating along that standard of care and that has legal support, um, that should be worth what um, they're paying, what my insurer is covering, and then what my co-insurance is handling. Whereas what we might be doing is buying a substandard product, but paying more for it. And I, I think these are the kind of things that are frustrating for all of us um, because we're out here on our own and, and ultimately being asked to defend our own interests and the institutional units, the purveyors of the product and treatment or development or education don't always have our best interests at heart, but we don't know that. And that's very, it's kind of frustrating. I mean, I think that, you know, I try, I'm trying to look at it as like glass half full. Okay. I think that, <laughs> I think that um, physicians especially, like they all really want to provide the best care to their patients, mm -hmm. but they truly don't know what that is by just, you know, opening up, a, by looking at what their neighbors are doing or by opening up the medical literature. Because the word standard of care, I mean, it's thrown all over the place. Like the way that term is abused, like that and practice guidelines and gold standards, it's astonishing how frequently that term is used and it means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. And yet, you know, patients see it and they're like, oh, yes, that sounds magnificent. Or, you know, even some doctors, you know, they read in a medical journal that, oh, it's the new standard of care in whatever, orthopedic surgery. I need to learn about this. Well, this is very impractical. Well, yeah, because only two people are doing it, the two people who published that paper. And there's just no regulation on using the phrase and it's, it's, it's confusing for providers and it's really confusing for patients. And it's, yeah. Well, really fascinating. I'm glad you're having a chance to keep this going. That sort of like work and your education are kind of really, really come together pretty nicely. Uh, and I hope, wish you luck at Chapman with the PhD and, you know, just don't burn the candle at both ends. Yeah, I kind of um, am. <laughs> you know, it's hard. It's hard. Thanks a lot, Amy. Any, anybody else have any other questions or comments? Oh, okay, thanks. Um, our, our last speaker is Dana Sanchor. She's an assistant director on the Penn Alumni Regional Clubs team. She received her BA in public relations from Penn State University and recently received her MLA from the University of Pennsylvania. Her paper is titled Missing on the Main Line, a personal exploration on the impact of true crime podcasts. Her readers were Michael Murray and Nancy Watterson. And it was really great when Dana ended up doing this project because I think that she had she was on the fence between two different projects. And we talked, and this podcast thing just sounded just too cool to not do. 
But we were having a hard time, right, Dana, trying to make sure that the readers agree this was also a cool project that was both going to be rewarding while you were doing it and maybe potentially rewarding for wherever you might go next. Um, and, and so I'm glad that you had the sort of fortitude to keep after it. And then we could work with you to make sure that we could find readers and, and faculty that could support this research. Uh, so now I'm kind of excited for everybody to hear a little bit about it. Thank you. Let me get the share, screen share going. So hi, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Francis Rosetta, it's Dana Santor. Um, I'm super excited to talk about my capstone project today. Um, you'll hear a little bit more about what Dr. Mansour was talking about, about how I kind of settled on my topic. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm a staff member here at Penn. Um, and after coming to the university and having so many of my colleagues kind of enrolling in, ac in academic programs, um, I decided to look into enrolling myself. Um, and what really drew me to the MLA program was the, the freedom to explore so many areas of interest, especially at the beginning of my journey. I felt there were so many things that I was interested in, and there was no way that I could possibly pick, you know, one narrowed field of study. Um, but obviously, as I progressed kind of through my MLA journey, um, I really found myself having a deep interest in mass media and entertainment. And there was definitely, you know, a dominating factor in my course selection around those topics. Um, and so many of my course projects really kind of prepared me in some way for my capstone. Um, so if you can change the slide. Um, so when it came down to selecting a topic for my capstone, um, I was really stuck and I had a couple different ideas. Um, I was working with a professor and, you know, she had kind of a topic idea that she was super interested in and I really liked it. Um, but in the back of my mind, I really was interested kind of in true crime podcasts and I really wanted to try to find a way to explore that. Um, so I was going back and forth um, and then it wasn't until a friend kind of said to me, you know, like you should really do what you're passionate about. Um, and then that's kind of how I settled on really moving forward with this idea of exploring true crime podcasts. Um, so my podcast was really broken up kind of into three different parts. Um, I had a, sol um, a section on interdisciplinary research, um, and then I actually started to work on putting together a podcast of my own, um, both of which I'll talk about um, coming up. Um, but I also included um, an autoethnography section where I kind of explored my own personal interest in true crime and how I became interested in the topic. Um, so before I moved to Philadelphia, I actually lived in Baltimore for several years around the time that Serial first came out. So if you're not familiar, um, Serial is kind of known and recognized as the founder of true crime podcasts. Um, it ex really exploded onto the scene in 2014 and basically kind of launched the entire podcast um, genre into what it is now. Um, so I obviously started listening and um, I just couldn't believe that so many of these things were happening in what was basically my own backyard. You know, I actually only lived at the time a few miles away from where the crime scene was, which was just kind of crazy to think about that something could happen you know, so close to where I lived. Um, and I still remember, you know, walking an extra mile on the treadmill or sitting in my car in the driveway, you know, anything to do, you know, for a few extra minutes to stall just to finish, you know, an episode. And so after that, I was hooked and I started watching, you know, documentaries and reading crime nonfiction novels. And, you know, I did it all. I couldn't get enough. Um, so like I said, it finally kind of hit me that, you know, this was what I was super interested in and wanted to explore for my capstone. Um, and then as I really started to think about putting my capstone together, you know, there were so many factors of true crime podcasts that were interested, to, interesting to me. And I wanted to kind of find a way to incorporate them, like why I was so interested in the topic, why society is so interested in the topic and, you know, are podcasts really making an impact in courtrooms or is it purely for entertainment? All right, let's change the slide. So with that, um, I really started to look at true crime podcasts as this convergence of entertainment, media studies, and criminal justice um, by bringing together listeners, producers, and investigators to impact unsolved investigations. 
Um, so the new media genre of true crime podcasts has proven to be an incredibly influential resource for cold cases by using the medium to produce entertaining yet informational content that draws attention to cold cases and ultimately helps to generate new leads and evidence. And so podcast hosts deliver captivating investigative journalism to mass audiences of listeners, which increases the awareness of the content and then attracting new leads for investigators. Okay, next slide. So now I'm mostly gonna kind of talk about my interdisciplinary research. I think it's definitely the most interesting part of my um, capstone. Um, so I, also, I started kind of looking at the popularity of the genre um, and, you know, I kind of thought it seemed like this genre has really kind of almost recently kind of soared into popularity. Um, but the genre has actually been around for decades and series like Law and Order, CSI, Criminal Minds, um, they're some of the longest running scripted TV series to ever exist. Um, and even as viewers are transitioning away from cable television to streaming services, um, you know, these new conglomerates are also cashing in on the addiction to true crime. Um, so Netflix is actually seen as the leading service, you know, streaming service with over 60 million subscribers um, in the U.S. And they're commonly known as the mecca for true crime programming. Um, a recent report of the 15 most popular Netflix docuseries found that over half were true crime and three of the top five were actually true crime. And if you've seen Making a Murderer, um, that one came in at number one. Um, so obviously the popularity is spilling over into podcasts as well. Um, true crime is one of the most prevalent podcast genres with hundreds of different podcasts, um, you know, relating to true crime and of the top 100 highest rated podcasts on iTunes, 22 are considered true crime. Um, so there are lots of different perspectives on why true crime podcasts are so successful. Um, it has been documented that most true crime podcast listeners are overwhelmingly female. Um, and one study conducted found that women often feel more drawn to true crime podcasts because they believe that listening to the content could help to educate themselves on avoiding situations and getting out of them. So I thought that that was super interesting. Um, I also, um, so other scholars also believe the success of podcasts over other broadcast media like radio or TV is actually due to factors including how the genre is disseminated. So the way that um, audiences engage with the content, um, podcasts are presented as this kind of compelling narrative in a conversational tone by the producer or host who uh, makes the audience feel like they're really more involved in kind of the journey and, you know, everything that's happening. So they become um, more impacted by the outcome of the podcast. So they actually will feel more um, part of what's going on and they'll actually have a deeper investment, um, which then promotes, promotes more activism in the case um, and ultimately helps lead um, to new leads. So while preparing for my podcast, sorry, I have a couple more things. Um, I also talked about uh, trial by media. So um, I kind of looked at that and how that is impacted with podcasts. Um, and one of the things that I noted in my research was the difference between um, traditional media and podcasts. So news outlets are often trying to be the first to break stories and rely more on attention grabbers over substance where podcasts are often retelling previously reported news and place a stronger emphasis on clear and reliable content. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. Um, yeah, that's good. We can slide change. So, okay, so for the last part of my capstone, um, I actually started working on a true crime podcast. Um, this was something that I have wanted to do for a really long time. So it was really great to kind of be able to use my capstone um, to explore the possibility of starting to put one together. Um, so while I'm not super far along in production and I still have a lot of work to do, my capstone really kind of helped to lay the foundation um, for my podcast. Um, so for my podcast, um, it's called Missing on the Main Line. Um, and I actually did, um, and am exploring a local, plate, a local case um, which I don't know if too many people are familiar, um, but Anna Machieska was a 43-year-old woman who um, is 
was living in Malvern and working in Westchester at the time, which is where I was living at the time. So um, again, it was kind of that close proximity for me, which kind of drew me to the case. Um, Anna is still missing. Um, no suspects have been identified in her case and little information has been, received, uh, has been released um, from authorities about the investigation. And um, so I remembered seeing posters on my morning commute to work and I remember just thinking, you know, like what happened? I'm, you know, I assumed that she was probably found. Um, and then I was looking into the case and it turned out she obviously wasn't. Um, so she still hasn't been found and the case is still unsolved. Um, so I did a lot of research into her case um, and her case was not super widely covered. And I actually mentioned that I was working on this to a couple of friends and family members in the area and nobody seemed to really know about her case, which kind of further, you know, backed up my um, research and things about, you know, how a podcast could really impact her case. Um, and then one of the other things I found was that news coverage that did cover her case that had a lot of um, incorrect facts or things were cited incorrectly, timelines were misconstrued, um, which I think, you know, also leads back to that you know, where people don't know that their information that they might have is important because, you know, they're confused about what the timeline was. So they don't really know. Um, so yeah, at this point, I have kind of laid out um, a whole bunch of episodes and I've started to gather all of my information to put into episodes. Um, I think the hardest part for me has been trying to figure out how to reach out to family members. I think it's kind of a tough thing to do, uh, especially because I feel like I have no real connection to the case. I didn't know her, um, you know, so that was definitely one of the things that I am struggling with. Um, but I know that I can obviously get past that. But so, yeah, so that was my, my kind of capstone project. Wow, really cool. Um, well, I'm glad you took on the opportunity, as your friend said, to pursue something that you were passionate about because you had the opportunity, particularly because you are interested in taking it the next step, working on a podcast yourself. Do you see any way this is going to connect to your professional life further? Um, not particularly, um, but of course, like this is obviously what I would like to be doing. So I hope eventually this will be able to kind of get me going in the direction that I would like to be going in for sure. Yeah, because I think wonder one thing about like working with and, and getting in touch with the family. If you were coming to this from a journalism background and going to the podcast thing, you might have that avenue um, of uh, entree into the, a conversation. Or if you were coming from the criminal justice background, but it might you know it might be tough because I wonder if part of the issue is do people feel that a lot of folks are amateurs or dabblers? Or do, do you as you did your research, the most successful podcasts? Where are many of them being generated from? What kind of people? Yeah, so most of them are honestly just random people that start kind of podcasts. Um, and then what I also did too is I reached out to a podcast host um, of In Your Own Backyard. So I highly recommend it if you haven't listened to it. Um, but he actually openly states in his first episode of his podcast that like he felt the same way, that like he had no connection to the case. And the only thing that he really wanted to do was make a difference. Um, and so I think a lot of kind of podcasts start out like that um, versus you know, kind of something else, so. And in this true crime that. genre, are a lot of them, are, are folks really focused sort of micro locally, like you said, with a, a physical connection, even if they don't have any other personal connection? Or do people jump into like cases that happened that made the news and disappear that might be far away from them? Yeah, most of them are pretty local. I think it's just easier to kind of explore it that way. You know, you're in close proximity to people so you can, you know, meet people you know, people will sometimes know people through association or something, especially if it's local to them. Um, so that kind of helps with getting, you know, kind of resources going with trying to, you know, connect with people to get content. And you mentioned a little bit about the connection to like criminal justice writ large and, and trial by media. Do you feel that this genre as it's really exploded in popularity has had some kind of influence on, is there some kind of reckoning moment with um, the, the reality that media plays an important role in what comes to trial and how things happen for good or ill. Do, do you feel that there's some way that, just say the institution of, uh, you know, we're all talking about police reform and criminal justice reform, is like the podcast movement in a way playing into that at all, do you think? 
So part of the background research that I did too was um, there was a study on podcast hosts and if they felt how they felt about that and their impact of trial by media. And I think it went back to kind of what I was talking about where they feel like they're investing a lot more time and effort into clear and concise kind of information giving versus, you know, headlines or kind of things. Um, so they're trying to be, you know, really unbiased. They're really just trying to be a source of giving information versus anything else. Um, so they really felt that, you know, their, their stuff was less um, impacted for trial by media. Mm -hmm. But I think there is a case definitely for it. And I think that that's definitely something um, that makes it really difficult, um, especially as I was doing mine. Um, you know, in the case, there's been no actual, you know, suspects kind of, you know, formatted, formally charged by, you know, the police, but obviously there are lots of theories and things and how do you kind of present the information um, as it is without seeming like you're trying to accuse someone who hasn't been right, formally right. charged. Now, do you think um, if you want to continue doing this, taking some, like taking a journalism class or somehow uh, figuring out how do other folks in, let's say, the more traditional media approach to reporting this kind of information handle these kinds of things um, to make sure that you are, or do you feel that would be, is that the old media and, you're, and, and the podcast world doesn't sort of participate in that? Um, no, I definitely think that would be extremely helpful. Um, there's a lot of work too that I didn't realize kind of went into formatting a podcast. I kind of assumed it would just be like kind of talking and, you know, figuring that out as I went. Um, but it definitely is a lot more intensive um, and trying to really lay out, you know, how things are going to go. Um, one of the things that I read was that, you know, people can get distracted so easily, especially without having a visual kind of representation. Um, so you have to do a lot more with the content that you're presenting. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think definitely like journalism could really kind of help with that. Oh, fascinating. Really, really neat. Wow, four really great talks. Uh, I really appreciate you guys spending some time with us. Um, you know, learned a lot. Uh, it's so exciting for me always to hear people coming from so many different directions, exploring stuff that becomes really meaningful to them, both intellectually and academically, but also potentially professionally and how it impacts the rest of your life. Um, but also going in so many different directions. You know, I'm an art historian, and so I spend a lot of my time really in that world of visual culture, but working with the MLA has let me really, you know, bounce into people who are studying in so many different areas, uh, you know, and really sort of learn a lot and enjoy it by proxy through what the students are doing. So you guys really uh, are doing some great work uh, and it's really exciting that you were able to, to spend some time with us. Really appreciate it. Well, uh, thanks for helping us do our very first virtual Capstone Forum. Um, and hopefully, you know, if we do these things again, they'll be done because we want to do them, not because we've been forced into it. <laughs> and uh, we'll have some chances to get together and connect. Well, thanks so much. And um, I hope everybody has a great night. Really appreciate you spending some time with us and talking a little bit about your capstones uh, and how you uh, work them out of your MLA program and create something that was really meaningful uh, and rewarding for you as you finish your program. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you guys so much. Thank, Thank you. Have a good night. Bye.